Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we'll discuss the recent issues that have come out with the disclosure about kill list, cyber war against Iran and other issues that really come out of it. Ajaz, the recent flame virus also substantiated that is an ongoing cyber war against Iran. Earlier two stats was used. There was a Duku virus. Both of, the, the, both of them have now been traced not only to the United States and Israel, but explicitly President Obama actually conducting weekly review of what was this, what the cyber war was all about. And now the results show, analysis by uh, Kaspersky labs show that the current flame virus also shares code, certain part of the code with the Stuxnet. nets. So it seems to be a continuation of the cyber war against Iran. Now, what does it mean in terms of international law? Well, in the larger context, uh, there are two things I would uh, start uh, with saying. You know, since the Vietnam War, the United States has been developing what they then called the automated battlefield. Uh, now, after about 40 years, we are seeing some very, very advanced expressions of that, where the entire battlefield is being uh, uh, automated, and to use the whole spectrum of technologies that they have. This, come, this is drone wars are, are on one side, cyber war is on the other. It's part of that whole um, thing. As for sovereignty, the United States has a a position that the, United, that the United States has issues of its own sovereignty in the national space of other countries. Their Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said as much in Delhi with respect to, to Fatah in Pakistan that this is an issue of our sovereignty. They have a sovereign right to attack through their cyber weapons and so on. Only two years ago or less, Mr. Obama said, using cyberspace for disruption of uh, technologies in other countries are acts of war. United States is a formal position that if you attack our, for instance, our power grid through cyber weapons. That's an act of war. That's an act of war and we have the right to put a missile, missile down your smoke stack. Absolutely. Is the exact Abs words used. Uh, yes, I, 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 thank you very much for, for reminding me of those words. Yes, uh, absolutely. It's an act of war. We have a right to retaliate in any way we want. But they have the right to, uh, to use this, exactly the same means against you. And it doesn't give Iran a right to retaliate, obviously. They're That's right. That's right. So what you actually have is a very, uh, later on I want to talk about this, a very new kind of development of the idea of an imperial sovereignty in which only the United States, which is an exceptional power, which has exceptional responsibilities to defend the free world, which is now the entire world, is now exempted from very many kinds of constraints that it requires from other countries. Now, coming back to the issue of cyber war, yeah. you know, general view of cyber war is a relatively benign one in public space because it's sort of seen to be tantamount with some viruses which infect your machines and so on. But the fact that cyber war can be targeted to the extent of actually destruction of equipment, in this case centrifuges, is one of the examples. And that's really physical damage, no different from any other physical attack. The bigger issue is that the collateral damage it can cause, it infected 5,000 machines in India and about, I think, uh, about 15, 16,000 machines in Indonesia, also other machines all over the world. These are really also programmable logic controllers which could be conceivably controlling hazardous equipment. And if that stops functioning, untargeted, collateral damage, it could cause enormous havoc. It seems that the United States is really not bothered about any of these aspects at all. What is very interesting is that neither India nor Indonesia made any big issue of it. This is the recognition of imperial sovereignty no. on the part of major countries like India who are themselves trying to make through, uh, make breakthroughs 
into fields of higher technology. Um, they did not object, didn't make any big noise. They accept that these are collateral damages. There is an argument some people have given that Fukushima may have been also uh, caused by partially because Siemens equipment might have been there failed, which I don't think is really true. But the point is really that I think people are completely underestimating the nature of this war and the fact that you don't have to have to be a big power in order to wage it. That you can actually wage it even as a small power, provided you're willing to put some resource into it. You know, the hundred million dollars was supposed to have been what it needs to create a virus like this. Big money, not small change. Not very big money when it comes to nation states. Quite, quite. You see, the United States has taken a wager that A, it will keep 10 steps ahead of others in this kind of war technology. By the time you have developed something, they have developed something much bigger. Secondly, that all, all of these little wars that, that they are waging are actually experiments in on-the-spot use of the weaponry that they have. That unless you go out of the lab and actually use it in the field, you do not know what the repercussions of it are. So now that they have done it and they know that these other things can happen and so on, now they will say, well, we are going to fix this and this, this is not going to happen. And you know, so on. Interestingly enough, Gaddafi having given up his nuclear program is one of the reasons why this particular virus succeeded because Gaddafi had given the AQ Khans uh, delivered centrifuges to Americans and they therefore had a base on which to experiment and that was what they had done before they attacked the Iranian centrifuges. Yeah. It's an interesting, very interesting, very interesting very issue. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Coming back to the drone wars which you had talked about earlier. Now, you know, drone wars is also uh, exactly the same kind of logic that you're talking about, that imperial sovereignty. I have the right to kill anybody anywhere. And this does not require the sanction of the country in which it is being waged. Yemen, of course, has partially agreed to this. Pakistan had tacitly agreed formally, not now is protesting. But apparently there are about 40 odd countries where U.S. today is targeting with drones and has quote unquote the right and the ability to take out people and are apparently taking them out. Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan we know about of yeah, course. These are, these, these are the most prominent. Well, uh, first of all I want to come to, uh, to the whole issue of agreement. Uh, you know, you put, a, you put a gun to somebody's head and get an agreement. You put a gun to Yemen's head, Pakistan's head and get an overt or a covert uh, agreement. Uh, 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 Pakistanis have known all along how much damage it would do them in the areas where this is being done. So that agreement is again, you know, that what I have been I was mentioning earlier about the exercise of imperial sovereignty and forcing others to accept it. Um, <clears throat> so that agreement is, is really sort of, you know, coercive agreement, coercively uh, uh, one of the things that you find in American thinking today is that there is in the United States a sharply declining consent to paying any price for fighting wars. Price in blood, in American blood. So you must fight wars that do not cost American blood. And so long as there is no American blood, All this is the okay. only country where opinion matters is American opinion. You know, that's a very important point. Hula massacre created an entire you know, outrage across the world because children were killed, number of you know, innocent women, women, children were killed, and so on. Now, on the drones, number of women and children have been killed. Any able-bodied male who dies in a drone attack, officially, United States considers them to be militants, irrespective of terrorists, irrespective of who they are. So, even by that, num that, by, by that philosophy, a number of women and children have been recently killed, both in Yemen and in Pakistan, Fatah, 
in which one wedding, uh, fab, uh, wedding was attacked and about 10 children died, doesn't seem to have created any ripple of uh, protest anywhere in the world. There said to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are said to be over 2,500 documented civilian killings in Fata alone through drone attacks. Not a sound of protest anywhere in the world. It, it's not even registered that this is happening. There are two or three other things I wanted to say about these, this drone business. One is the level at which it is, the, the rapidity with, with which this is now increasing. The United States had less than 50 drones deployed in 2001. By now, the U.S. Air Force alone has 7,500. And that, that is not the CIA. That is not the Navy, and so on. That, that's one sort of thing, the speed at, at which it is going. Second factor which is bound to occur is very fast proliferation. Because this is technology that any number of states can replicate. Can, can replicate and will want to have for precisely the reasons and very often for use inside their territory. And that is the third thing I want to come to. Drones will be used inside the United States for surveillance. Already the police is asking for it. In the fact, police is asking for it. American universities now ha are introducing, one university after the other is introducing courses to train pilots for these drones, which are unmanned things, pilots are the ones who sit in some lab somewhere and uh, so on. American, for, for American universities, there is a new field in which to offer courses and make money. You know, coming to an earlier issue, the drones are now being deployed against what are called signature strikes. Now, earlier we were told there is a skill list which President Obama is to do weekly reviews. Tuesday is supposed to be the day on which the skill decisions are taken well, and baseball specific cards. baseball cards. Specific people are identified and killed. But at the same time, there is public information, official information, for instance, in Yemen as well as in Fatah, that signature strikes are allowed. Signature strikes means if you see something on the ground which makes people uh, believe that you are behaving suspiciously, gathering together in some place of some men, whether it's to play football or something, it doesn't matter. These are considered signature strikes. No identification required strikes are done. And a lot of the strikes in Yemen and Fatah are signature strikes. Yeah. And the next stage of technology, which is already there, it's getting deployed. Now, the next generation of drones will in fact need no pilots. They will be robotic and those robots will decide where to strike and when. Well, uh, I, I would really be not so sanguine about these robots because at the moment, I think the human robots who are piloting are as good or as bad. Yeah, Got but, it. But, but, but. What, that, what, that, what that actually means is that a signature strike can actually be launched by a robotic uh, drone without any authorization from anywhere and any account of why it happened. 